Good day. I will spend the next 15 minutes reviewing the common injury patterns we see in the pediatric cervical spine. And I have no disclosures for this presentation. Now there are three basic questions I will address in this presentation. Why are pediatric injuries different from adults? How should initial imaging be performed? And what are the imaging findings and mimics of pediatric spine injuries? And because we only have 15 minutes, I'll focus on cervical spine injuries, which are where most injuries are encountered and where the greatest variation between child and adult injuries occurs. Now let's start with why pediatric spine injuries are different from adults. There are several ways in which a neonate's head and neck are very different from an adult. Babies have very large heads relative to their spine, and they also have very horizontal facets, incomplete ossification and fusion of the spine, and relatively lax ligaments. All of these factors lead to a very different set of injuries in kids compared to adults. Now the transformation from neonate to adult spine morphology is a gradual process occurring throughout childhood. However, much of the mineralization and morphologic transformation occurs by approximately nine years of age. So nine years becomes an important demarcation of injury with patients after nine years of age having more adult-like injury patterns. However, even in these older children, significant ligament and bone maturation is still occurring and their injury patterns are only similar, not identical to adults. Now, how should children be initially imaged? There is debate about the appropriateness of CT versus radiographs and the initial imaging in kids with several major societies weighing in. The East Society, which is one of the largest trauma societies in the United States, advocates the use of CT as the first line of assessment in all trauma patients, regardless of patient's age, while the ACR generally says radiographs are preferred over CT for initial assessment. A couple of major neurosurgical societies have split the difference between these two opinions, stating CT or radiographs are equivalent in initial trauma assessment. There is a little nuance to these positions and a more detailed explanation of the positions can be found in the handout for this presentation. My institution generally follows the East Society guidelines, so almost all pediatric trauma gets a cervical CT, which I wholly support. Prior studies vary widely in the reported sensitivity of radiographs for identifying significant pediatric cervical injuries, with reported sensitivities ranging from about 65% to 95%. At my institution, we found of pediatric patients with significant cervical spine injuries that had radiographs performed prior to CT, over 40% had the initial radiographs read as normal. There is some selection bias in that number, but those results are in line with my general experience in pediatric trauma, which is radiographs are closer to 65% sensitivity than 95% sensitivity for identifying pediatric cervical spine injuries. Okay, now let's dive into the diagnosis of cervical spine injuries. Just like in the adult spine, it can be beneficial to think of pediatric cervical injuries in terms of upper cervical injuries above the C2-3 level and lower cervical injuries. Upper cervical spine injuries are the predominant injury pattern seen in patients under the age of nine, while lower cervical spine injuries dominate in patients nine years and older. In kids, most upper cervical injuries will either be distraction type injuries or fractures through the synchondroses, and this is particularly true for patients under the age of nine. In this age group, the most common fractures we see are avulsions of the occipital condyles from distraction injuries, type one DENS fractures, which are avulsion fractures through the apical synchondrosis of the DENS, and type three DENS fractures, which are fractures through the synchondrosis of the C2 vertebral body. Once kids reach nine years of age, they start to exhibit injuries that are similar to what we encounter in young adults, such as type two DENS fractures or traumatic spondylolysis at C2, which is commonly referred to as a hangman's fracture. It is important to remember that even though these older children will have some of the more adult type injuries, they are still susceptible to distraction and synchondrosis injuries, just not as much as very young patients. Again, distraction is the most common injury morphology of the upper cervical spine in children, and distraction injuries can present as only soft tissue injury without fracture. To identify these injuries, we rely really have to rely on a combination of identifying upper cervical malalignment for which we use measurements and identifying evidence of soft tissue injury. There are many different measurements that have been described to assess normal craniocervical junction alignment, but due to time restrictions, I will only review the measurements that I think are the most useful and well-known measurements. However, descriptions of the other measurements can be found in the handout for this presentation. Also, the distances presented will be for CT, 
measurements for radiographs can also be found in the presentation handout. The atlanto-occipital distance is probably the best measurement for identifying craniocervical distraction injuries. In a study of 48 pediatric patients with craniocervical distraction injuries at my institution, we found atlanto-occipital distance to be the most accurate measurement for identifying craniocervical injuries. And this has been a similar finding in a few other studies. This distance is just the shortest distance between the occipital condyle and the C1 lateral mass. On CT, a cutoff of 2.5 millimeters has the highest accuracy for identifying craniocervical injury. The Bayesian dens distance is the distance from the Bayesian to the tip of the dens. After the atlanto-occipital distance, we have found the Bayesian dens distance to be the next most accurate measurement for identifying craniocervical injuries. Distances of 8.5 to 10.5 millimeters have been proposed for cutoff values to identify craniocervical injury, but based on results from our institution, I recommend using the lower cutoff of 8.5 millimeters, as we found a cutoff of 10.5 millimeters would miss a significant number of craniocervical injuries. The powers ratio is the ratio of a line drawn from the Bayesian to the posterior arch of C1, which is line A, and a line drawn from the Opithion to the anterior arch of C1, which is line B. Most craniocervical injuries result in the skull sliding forward, which results in lengthening of line A and shortening of line B, leading to an increase in the powers ratio. There is debate about what is considered a normal ratio. Originally, a ratio of greater than one was recommended for suggesting injury. However, more recent studies have suggested a ratio of greater than 0.9 suggest injury, which I have found to be a more accurate cutoff value. The final measurement I will mention is the atlantodental distance, which is the shortest distance between the anterior arch of C1 and the dens. Less than three millimeters is considered normal. I would note that even though the atlantodental distance is an often mentioned measurement, I have found it to have poor accuracy for identifying upper cervical injuries. Measurements of the upper cervical spine can be helpful for recognizing craniocervical injuries, particularly if you are inexperienced in reading pediatric cervical spine trauma. However, I find measurements of limited utility because about half of craniocervical injuries in kids don't result in gross malalignment of the upper cervical spine. In these patients, close inspection for subjective findings of craniocervical injury can be very helpful in making the diagnosis. In my institution's study of pediatric patients with craniocervical junction injuries, we found over 90% of craniocervical junction injuries had at least one of the four subjective findings shown here. Non-concentric appearance of the atlanto-occipital joints is a fairly common finding in patients with craniocervical junction injuries. It was present in almost two-thirds of craniocervical injury patients we assessed in our study. Because the head tends to slide forward in craniocervical injuries, you will often see widening of the posterior aspect of the occipital joint compared to the anterior aspect, and this can be seen even when the joint space measures less than the 2.5 millimeter cutoff used to define pathologic widening. Extradural hemorrhage is the most common soft tissue finding I see on CT in patients with upper cervical injuries, and is seen in about three quarters of patients. This hemorrhage often presents as stripping of the tectorial membrane off the clivus, like you see on the left, or stripping of the ligamentum flavum, like on the right. Prevertebral edema and hemorrhage is another indicator of craniocervical injury. Here we see two different cases of prevertebral hemorrhage. And notice how the hemorrhage sits between the retropharyngeal fat and the vertebral bodies, displacing the retropharyngeal fat anteriorly. This is typical of prevertebral hemorrhage and can be used to help identify subtle cases of hemorrhage by recognizing focal soft tissue density between the fat and bone. The last commonly seen soft tissue finding on CT is paraspinous or interspinous edema. And that isn't because it's uncommon, but more because it is hard to recognize edema in this region on CT unless it is florid. I identify interspinous edema by seeing confluent replacement of interspinous fat by soft tissue density. On the left, we have normal, a normal patient, and you can see how there is at least some fat grossly visible between the spinous processes at each level, which is usually the case. On the right, we see complete obliteration of the interspinous fat by soft tissue at C12, representing interspinous edema and hemorrhage. Paraspinous edema can present as either focal decreased attenuation and expansion of the muscle, like you see on the left, or as edema obscuring the intermuscle fat planes, like on the right. Now let's move on to injuries below the C2 level. In patients less than nine years of age, most injuries are distraction type injuries. 
either hyperflexion distraction injuries or pure distraction injuries like this extreme example on the right. Compression or burst fractures of the lower cervical spine are extremely rare in patients this young. To identify distraction injuries, you'll want to look for evidence of malalignment, such as widening of the inner spinous distance, disc space widening, or focal kyphosis of the cervical spine. You also want to assess for soft tissue findings similar to what you see in the upper cervical spine, although soft tissue findings are less common at the lower cervical levels. In kids nine years and older, we begin to see more adult type injuries, meaning compression type fractures are more common than distraction injuries. And about 40% will be compression fractures of the vertebral body, like the example on the right. The remaining 60% of compression type injuries are posterior element fractures. Just like in adults, most of these fractures are of the transverse process and spinous process, like these examples, and a large majority of these fractures occur at the lowest cervical levels. Now that we've reviewed what to look for to identify pediatric cervical injuries, I would like to spend a little time going over four relatively common mimics of cervical injury in kids. An os odontoidum is a chronic ununited accessory ossification center at the junction of the dens in the C2 vertebral body. It can be difficult to differentiate an os odontoidum from type 2 dens fracture on radiographs, but usually an os odontoidum can be easily recognized as a chronic abnormality on CT based on the smooth corticated margins seen along the ossicle and adjacent C2 vertebral body. Just because the ossicle is chronic, however, doesn't mean it's stable, and an os odontoidum can be a source of either acute or chronic pain and neurovascular compromise. C23 pseudosubluxation is a very common physiologic finding that can simulate cervical injury, particularly in radiographs. Children, particularly those less than nine years old, can present with anterolist thesis of the C2 vertebral body over the C3 vertebral body, which can be confused with post-traumatic subluxation. Pseudo-subluxation, though, can be differentiated from true subluxation by recognizing that while there is offset of the C23 vertebral bodies, the spinolaminar line remains in normal alignment at the C1 through C3 levels. Physiologic wedging, like you see here, is another very common phenomenon in the subaxial spine, particularly in patients under the age of nine. This is where it is important to remember that vertebral body compression fractures are extremely rare in patients younger than nine. So when you see wedge-shaped deformity of the vertebral body in very young patients, it is almost always physiologic. The final anatomic variant I'd like to mention are epiphyseal ring ossification centers. Epiphyseal ring ossification centers lie at the superior and inferior aspect of each of the subaxial vertebral bodies. As they begin to ossify and before they fuse with the vertebral bodies, they look like small flecks of calcification along the anterior corners of the vertebral bodies. These calcifications can be easily confused for small avulsion fragments along the anterior margin of the vertebral body related to a hyperextension injury. However, hyperextension injuries in the subaxial spine are very rare in children, so it is extremely uncommon to see an avulsion from the anterior margin of the subaxial vertebrae. In the final minute, I'd like to mention an injury that is not exclusively seen in children, but is definitely one most commonly thought of as occurring in children, and that is sequora, or spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality. Clinically, it is a relatively common phenomenon as it comprises anywhere from about 10 to 20% of spinal cord injuries. Not surprisingly, sequora most commonly occurs in very young pediatric patients when the spine is most pliable and able to sustain extreme deforming forces without fracture. Most sequora occurs in the cervical spine, and the and upper cervical spine injuries are most common in very young patients. Now, here's a classic example of sequora. No fracture or malalignment is present in the CT on the left, and no ligament injury was identified on MRI. Cord contusion can be seen along the right side of the cord at the C1 level, depicted by the arrows. So in summary, in patients under the age of nine, Injuries tend to be distraction injuries of the upper cervical spine. In patients nine years and older, injuries are more often in the subaxial spine, and these older children tend to have fracture patterns more like what you see in adults. Remember, craniocervical measurements are not very accurate for identifying upper cervical injuries, so be sure to look for subjective soft tissue findings and non-concentric atlantoccipital joints, as these may be the only findings of cervical injury on initial imaging. Thank you for your time, and if you would like to learn more about pediatric cervical spine trauma, 
Here are some selected references from the presentation. <laughs> 